more book quote reading from my Zen Mind Balcony. Gut and Psychology Syndrome by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride What we eat has a direct effect on the composition of the gut flora. A modern diet of convenience rather than nutrition full of processed foods has a serious detrimental effect on the gut flora. Too many sugary foods and processed carbohydrates increase numbers of different fungi, candida species in particular, streptococci, staphylococci, some clostridia species, bacteroids and some aerobic opportunistic bacteria. Processed and sugary carbohydrates like white bread, cakes, biscuits, pastries and pasta also promote population of the gut with worms and other parasites. A diet high in fiber from grains, bran and breakfast cereals in particular has a profound negative effect on the gut flora. Gut health and general body metabolism predisposing the person to IBS, bowel cancer, nutritional deficiencies and many other problems. Fruit and vegetables provide a better quality fiber that is not as harsh for the digestive system. Stress. A short-term stress has a detrimental effect on the gut flora, but it usually recovers well after the stressful situation is over. However, a long-term physical or psychological stress can do permanent damage to the indigenous flora. This damage gets passed from generation to generation. As a newborn child gets its gut flora from the mother. And as the damage is passed through generations, it gets deeper and deeper. This process reflects in the severity of health problems related to abnormal gut flora seen in generations. For example, this is quite a common scenario which I see in my clinic. A grandmother has mild digestive problems as a result of low-key gut dysbiosis. She passes moderately abnormal gut flora to her daughter. On top of that, she decides not to breastfeed, because it is not fashionable. As a result, her daughter suffers from allergies, migraines, PMS and digestive problems. There is abundant evidence that many modern disease processes, including those resulting in cardiovascular disease, elevated triglyceride levels, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, hypoglycemia and cancer, to name a few, are the product not of excess natural fat in the diet but of excess carbohydrates. Other contributing factors certainly include ultra-prevalent and unnatural trans fats, rancid fats, unnaturally high quantities of dietary omega-6 fatty acids from vegetable oils, heavy metals and other pollutants, artificial chemicals and additives, and the widespread use of xenoestrogens. The artificial estrogen-like compounds used in pesticides, 
lotions, shampoos, plastics and many other common household items, cosmetics and cleaning supplies. Current marketing ploys and diet dictocrats unrelentingly cling to other notions despite overwhelming and well-documented evidence to the contrary. More modern ills can be traced to chronic carbohydrate consumption than to any other single factor. Trans fats might come in at a close second. Nora Getgauda's Primal Body, Primal Mind Beyond Paleo for Total Health and Longer Life. That excessive sugar intake and high calorie malnutrition are associated not only with diminished thiamine intake but also disrupt thiamine metabolism itself, decreasing absorption and increasing excretion. Thereafter, the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA is limited, diminishing acetylcholine synesthesis and disrupting autonomic balance. Concurrently, the lack of thiamine impairs oxidative capacity, reducing ATP production and increasing reactive oxygen species ROS, the inflammatory cascades, and if sufficiently serious or chronic, the changes in hemostasis noted in thiamine deficiency induced pseudo hypoxia. In adults, these cascades may take years to fully foment and present with sufficient strengths to be clinically recognizable. Derek Lonsdale, Chandler Mars, Diamine Deficiency Disease, Dysautonomia and High Calorie Malnutrition. Insulin emerges as a key player in many of the diseases that, unfortunately, are becoming remarkably common, from migraine headaches to fatty liver disease, high blood pressure and dementia. Ben reveals the scientific studies linking these seemingly distinct health problems and more to insulin resistance. And, like so many other health disorders, this one is all too common. A recent study suggested that as many as 85% of American adults may be insulin resistant and many other countries are likely at similar levels or worse. Carbohydrates other than the largely indigestible variety found in fibrous vegetables and greens have generally played a minimal role at best through most of human evolution. Fruit was consumed only seasonally by our Neo-Paleolithic ancestors in most places, and wild fruit is extremely fibrous and smaller in size, with less total sugar content. Many potatoes and tubers would have required extensive cooking to neutralize extremely toxic alkaloids. Wild varieties that would have been available to us through most of our history as a species can be especially toxic. In other words, it isn't likely we were eating baked potatoes with our woolly mammoth steak or much starch at all. In fact, of all the macronutrients, that is, protein, fats and carbohydrates, the only ones for which there are no actual human dietary requirements, are carbohydrates. This is a critical and very fundamental point to remember. 
We don't ever have to eat any sugar or starch of any kind at all in order to be optimally healthy. Benjamin Bickman, Why We Get Sick, The Hidden Epidemic at the Root of Most Chronic Disease and How to Fight It. In fact, insulin resistance is the most common health disorder worldwide and it affects more people, adults and children, each year than any other. And yet most people are not familiar with the term insulin resistance or if they are, they don't understand it. Not surprising, I'm a biomedical scientist and professor and though I now focus on insulin resistance. I was once totally in the dark about this condition too. Nutrient deficiencies. Because of their role in oxidative metabolism and a host of other enzymatic reactions evoke biochemical lesions, the pathological cascades initiated as a result become manifest long before anatomical lesions appear and more conventional testing admits. Over the past few decades all these conditions have been on the rise. But why? You're about to learn that a lot of it comes down to one root cause, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, meaning too much insulin in the blood. But wait, isn't that actually two root causes? No, they are the same thing, like two sides of the same coin, differing only in the way you look at it. As a nephrologist, I specialize in kidney disease and the most common cause of kidney disease is type 2 diabetes. In only 30 years, the number of people with diagnosed diabetes has quadrupled and I've seen its disastrous effects firsthand. It's not just about kidney disease. Patients with type 2 diabetes are also at hugely increased risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, blindness, nerve damage, amputation and chronic infections. All chronic diseases involve a number of different causes and factors, but we know that type 2 diabetes, the prototypical state of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance is one of the biggest and our failure to understand the root cause of diabetes means that our approach to diagnosing and treating it is all wrong. I began trying to find any evidence of insulin resistance in other diseases and I learned that it was present in almost every chronic disease. It was especially present in the chronic conditions that stem from a diet high in processed and artificial foods, as you will see. This was something I'd never really appreciated. Insulin resistance causing diseases other than diabetes and yet I was considered an expert on insulin resistance. We are sick worldwide. We are struggling with diseases that were once very rare and in many cases we're losing the fight. Each year roughly 10 million people die from cancer and almost 20 million people die from heart disease around the world. Another 50 million people globally have Alzheimer's disease 
and almost a half a billion of us have diabetes. While diseases like these are becoming increasingly common, other less lethal conditions are also on the rise. Roughly 40% of adults worldwide are considered overweight or obese. Sweet and starchy foods feed the pathogenic microbes in the gut, allowing them to grow in number and damage the gut wall. At the same time, these proliferating pathogens in the gut start producing large amounts of toxins, which absorb through the damaged gut wall into the bloodstream and get carried to the brain. As the gut function deteriorates, the foods do not get the chance to be digested properly before they absorb through the damaged gut wall. People with food allergies and intolerances should go through the introduction diet in order to heal and seal their gut lining. The reason for allergies and food intolerances is a so-called leaky gut. When the gut lining is damaged by abnormal microflora, foods do not get the chance to be digested properly before they get absorbed through this damaged wall and cause the immune system to react to them. Once absorbed into the blood, these partially digested foods trigger very complex immune reactions called food allergy or intolerance. Histamine, an important neurotransmitter in the body, Certain cells in the body normally produce histamine. However, it is also produced by protose family, E. coli family, staphylococci and many other bacteria in the gut. In a situation where these opportunistic bacteria overgrow due to the lack of control from the beneficial flora, they start producing too much histamine. As histamine takes part in many different functions in the body, all these functions go wrong with the excess of histamine coming into the blood. These are the common symptoms of this condition. Allergies, constantly low blood pressure, excessive production of body fluids, like saliva dysfunction of the hypothalamus with hormonal changes, PMS is a common result, emotional instability, sleep abnormalities, addictions and many others. An excess of histamine in the body is called histodelia. This condition was found by Dr. Carl Pfeiffer in many people with depression, schizophrenia, addictions and autism. There you go. Sugar and anything made with sugar was once called a white death. It deserves 100% of this title. The consumption of sugar in the world has grown to enormous proportions in the last century. It is estimated that an average Western person consumes about 160 to 200 lb of this highly processed substance per year. Sugar is everywhere and it is hard to find any processed food without it. Apart from causing the blood glucose roller coaster and having a detrimental effect on the gut flora, it has been shown to have a direct damaging effect on the immune system, which is already compromised in GAPS patients. Processed carbohydrates get absorbed very quickly, producing an unnaturally rapid increase in blood glucose. Blood glucose is one of those factors which our bodies go 
to great lengths to keep within certain limits because both high and low values are harmful. A rapid increase in blood glucose, called hyperglycemia, puts the body into a state of shock, prompting it to pump out lots of insulin very quickly to deal with the excessive glucose as a result of this overproduction of insulin. About an hour later, the person has a very low level of blood glucose, called hypoglycemia. Did any of you notice that after eating a sugar breakfast cereal in the morning, you feel hungry again in an hour? That is hypoglycemia. What do people usually have at the time in the morning to satisfy their hunger? A biscuit, a chocolate bar, a coffee or something like that. And the whole cycle of hyper-hypoglycemia begins again. This up and down blood glucose roller coaster is extremely harmful. There has been an interesting experiment performed in one of the food laboratories. They analyzed the nutritional value of some brands of breakfast cereals and the paper boxes in which these cereals were packaged. The analysis showed that the box made of wood pulp had more useful nutrients in it than the cereal inside. Indeed, breakfast cereals have got very low nutritional value. But that is not all. They are saturated with vegetable oil, which has been heated to a very high temperature. Any vegetable oil that has been heated has got substances called trans fatty acids, which are unsaturated fatty acids with an altered chemical structure. What they do in the body is to replace the vital omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids in cellular structure, making the cells dysfunctional. Consuming trans fatty acids has a direct damaging effect on the immune system. They are known to increase the activity of the Th2 and weaken Th1 immunity. As you remember, the Th1 immunity is already suppressed in many GAPS patients and Th2 is overactive. Cancer, heart disease, eczema, asthma and many neurological and psychiatric conditions have been linked to trans fatty acids in the diet. Gluten is a protein present in grains, mainly wheat, rye, oats and barley. Casein is a milk protein present in cow, goat, sheep, human and all other milk and milk products. In the bodies of GAPS people, these proteins do not get digested properly and turn into substances with similar chemical structures to opiates such as morphine and heroin. There has been quite a substantial amount of research done in this area by Dohan, Reichelt, Shattuck, Kate and others, where gluten and casein peptide, called gluteomorphins and casomorphins, were detected in the urine of patients with schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, postpartum psychosis, epilepsy, Down syndrome, depression and some autoimmune problems like rheumatoid arthritis. These opiates from grains and milk are thought to get through the blood brain barrier and block certain areas of the brain just as morphine or heroin would do. Soya is a natural goitrogen. What does this mean? It means that soya has an ability to impair iodine absorption and reduce thyroid function, 
Due to various toxins found in GAPS patients, they are, almost without exception, hypothyroid, which means that their thyroid function is already impaired. Low thyroid function has very serious implications for a growing child, including abnormalities in brain development and maturation. Having soya in the diet will reduce the child's thyroid function even further. The form in which soya is used in the West is called soy protein isolate. How is it made? After removing the fiber with an alkaline solution, the soybeans are put into large aluminium tanks with an acid wash. Acid makes the soybeans absorb aluminium, which will remain in the end product. Aluminium has been linked to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, there has been a lot of publicity recently linking soy consumption with these mental disorders. After the aluminium acid wash, the beans are treated with many other chemicals including nitrates which have been implicated in cancer development. The end product is an almost tasteless powder, easy to use and add to any food. Up to 60% of processed foods including soya milk and soya infant formulas contain this powder. If you compare the amounts of vitamins in meat, fish or other animal products with grains, it is the animal products which are at the top of the list. Let us just have a look at some of them. Vitamin B1, thiamine, the richest sources are pork, liver, heart and kidneys. Vitamin B2, riboflavin, the richest sources are eggs, meat, milk, poultry and fish. Vitamin D3, niacin, the richest sources are meat and poultry. Vitamin B5, pantothenic acid. The richest sources are meats and liver. Vitamin B6, pyridoxine. The richest sources are meat, poultry, fish and eggs. Vitamin B12, cyanocobalamin. The richest sources are meat, poultry, fish, eggs and milk. Biotin. The richest sources are liver and egg yolks. Vitamin A. The richest sources are liver, fish, egg, yolks and butter. We are talking about the real vitamin A, which is ready for the body to use. Eggs. Eggs are one of the most nourishing and easy to digest foods on this planet. Raw egg yolk has been compared with human breast milk because it can be absorbed almost 100% without needing digestion. Egg yolks will provide you with most essential amino acids, many vitamins B1, B2, B6, B12, A, D and biotin. Essential fatty acids, a lot of zinc, magnesium and many other nutrients which GAPS children and adults are deficient in. Eggs are particularly rich in vitamin B12, which is vital for normal development of the nervous system and immunity. The large majority of GAPS patients are deficient in B12 and hence anemic. Egg yolks are very rich in choline, and amino acid essential for the nervous system and the liver to function. Choline is a building block of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which the brain uses for cognitive or learning processes and memory amongst its many functions. The majority of GAPS patients are anemic. It is essential for people with anemia to have red meats on a regular basis, lamb, beef, game and organ meats in particular. 
because these foods are the best remedy for anemia. They not only provide iron in the hem form, the form which the human body absorbs best, they also provide the B vitamins and other nutrients essential for treating anemia. Avoid lean meats. Our physiology can only use meat fibers when they come with some fat, collagen and other substances that a proper piece of meat will provide. Gaps people need plenty of animal fats, so cook pieces with a good fat covering for them. When we eat poultry, it is important to eat the skin and the fats as well as the meat. When we eat fish, it is essential to eat the skin as well as the meat. That is why fish must always be the scaled before cooking. Vitamin D. The richest sources are fish liver oils, eggs, fish, folic acid. The richest source by far is liver. Green leafy vegetables are considered a good source, though they contain much less folic acid and are more difficult to digest. It is easier for the human digestive system to extract nutrients from animal foods. Folic acid is particularly essential to have in pregnancy in order to prevent neural tube defects in the baby. That is why every traditional culture made sure that pregnant women ate liver regularly in order to provide plenty of folic acid as well as many other nutrients in the biochemical form which is easy to digest and assimilate. Vitamin K2 Menaquinone The richest sources are organ meats, full fat cheese, good quality butter and cream, yellow and orange from grass fed animals. Animal fats like duck fat or the emu oil and egg yolks. We are what we are. Our children are physically made by us from whatever we are made of. Some of these things like genetics we are born with and there is nothing we can do about them. Some were given to us by our parents, like our bodily microbial flora and our eating habits. Some were created by our lifestyles and choices. Some were imposed on us by our modern society and the world we live in. Most parents of GAPS children I have met, rather than concentrating on their feeling of guilt, find a way of learning as much as possible about their children's condition and concentrating on what can be done about it. So let's carry on learning. GAPS children and adults who are prone to diarrhea or loose stools have to have low fiber in their diet until the diarrhea clears. Apart from fiber, there is another substance which most of us would not be able to digest without our good bacteria in the gut. This substance is milk sugar, called lactose. It is a well-known fact that a lot of people are lactose intolerant, which means that they can't digest milk. Most GAPS children and adults are among these people. So, if you are trying to avoid something in particular like sugar or gluten, for example, reading an ingredient list may not always help you. If we look at the supermarket shelves, we will see that the bulk of processed foods are carbohydrates. All of those breakfast cereals, crisps, biscuits, crackers, breads, 
pastries, pastas, chocolates, sweets, jams, condiments, sugar, preserved fruit and vegetables, frozen pre-cooked meals with starches and batter are highly processed carbohydrates. To allow the enterocytes to recover and to stop feeding abnormal gut flora, starch has to be out of the diet for GAPS children and adults. It means no grains or anything made out of them and no starchy vegetables. Clinical practice shows that when the gut has been given a long enough period without double sugars and starch, it has a good chance of recovery. To summarize, a GAPS patient has to avoid all grains and anything made out of them. Wheat, rye, rice, oats, corn, maize, sorghum, barley, buckwheat, millet, spelt, triticale, bulgur, tapioca, quinoa, couscous, some of them are not strictly grains but are commonly perceived as such, so we have listed them here. This will remove a lot of starch and all gluten from the diet. In fact, removal of all grains makes the diet truly gluten-free. All starchy vegetables and anything made out of them, potato, yams, sweet potato, parsnip, Jerusalem artichoke, cassava, arrowroot and taro, sugar and anything that contains it, starchy beans and peas, soybeans, mung beans, carbanzo beans, bean sprouts, chickpeas, fava beans, lactose and anything that contains it, fluid or dried milk of any type, commercially produced yogurt, buttermilk and sour cream processed foods with added lactose. In my opinion, what unites all these diets is the low carbohydrate content, in particular the exclusion of heavy starchy complex carbohydrates. The GAPS diet does the same. All starch and complex carbohydrates are removed. As we have discussed in this book, carbohydrates, particularly starch and refined sugars, feed pathogens in the body, in the gut and everywhere else. By severely restricting carbohydrates in the diet, the activity of pathogens in the body is also severely restricted. From the beginning of its existence, the side effect of GAPS nutritional protocol in many of my patients was the disappearance of fits, seizures, tics, spasms and involuntary movements, whether truly epileptic or not. In many children, the fits just stop and never come back. In others, the severity and frequency of seizures reduce gradually to stop altogether or stabilize at some manageable level. Painkillers or analgesics like aspirin or ibuprofen are often prescribed for long periods of time to people with chronic pain. These drugs stimulate growth of hemolytic forms of bacteria and Campylobacter in the gut, all of which are capable of causing disease. GAPS children and adults have digestive problems, sometimes quite severe. Colic, bloating, flatulence, diarrhea, constipation, feeding difficulties and malnourishment, all to various degrees, are a typical part of autism, schizophrenia, and other GAPS conditions. Doctors often explain these symptoms as a result of patients' funny feeding habits and are not inclined to investigate them. 
whether we look at a child or an adult with gaps. In the majority of cases, digestive problems start at weaning time or times when breast milk gets replaced with formula milk and other foods get introduced. The second year of life is the time when many GAPS children start developing fussy eating habits, refusing a whole lot of foodstuffs and limiting their diet to a handful of foods, usually starchy and sweet. Breakfast cereals, crisps, chips, popcorn, cakes, biscuits, sweets, bananas, bread, rice, sweet yogurts. Most of these children would refuse to have vegetables, fruit, apart from bananas, meats, fish and eggs. About 60 to 70 percent of the autistic children I have seen in my clinic would have an extremely limited diet, consisting sometimes of two or three items. It is quite rare to meet an autistic child who is not fussy with food. Assessing gait and balance compared with the healthy controls, individuals with mitochondrial damage or disease present with reduced gait speed, take smaller steps and show a greater step time with a large degree of width and length variability. The telltale drunken sailor gait is often present, although it may be subtle at first. Individuals with the largest illness load and longer disease trajectories perform most poorly. Basic cerebellar function can be assessed easily and quickly by simply watching the patient walk and perform other organized movements. In the case of autism, all these symptoms undoubtedly cause children a lot of discomfort and pain. But unfortunately, due to their inability to communicate, most autistic children cannot tell their parents about it. So they express their feelings in other ways. Self-stimulation, self-destruction, tantrums, refusing to eat, etc. Many children would assume strange postures and positions in order to relieve abdominal discomfort, usually pressing their dummies on hard parts of furniture. Children with other gaps conditions who do not have communication problems often complain of tummy aches and feeling nauseous. In most cases, these children are not tested or investigated by gastroenterologists. In a few published cases, when autistic children have been investigated, an x-ray of their digestive tract almost invariably showed a condition called phacal compaction with an overspill syndrome. This is why this colitis was named nonspecific, because it could not be assigned to any existing diagnosis. Dr. Wakefield's team called it autistic enterocolitis. This term is yet to be accepted into the official medical vocabulary, but for those who work with autistic children, it is a very good term to use. The findings of Dr. Andrew Wakefield and his team, who have examined hundreds of autistic children, have been independently supported by a number of other researchers in the world. Apart from published research, there are a number of practicing doctors around the world whose clinical observations support the fact that autistic children have a digestive disorder. The 
severity of which may differ in different children. Based on my clinical experience, I would strongly add my voice to theirs. In fact, I have yet to meet an autistic child without digestive problems. Hi, and welcome to LCAL Low Carb Ancestral Living with Pim Johnson. Today's guest is someone who is very passionate about diet and how different diets affect the quality of life and the symptoms that autistic people have. And he is also the founder of uh, Autistic Carnivores on Facebook, and he has his own YouTube channel that is called Meat Mosaic. Just jumping straight in, if you don't mind, can you just start telling us a little bit about how it was for you growing up with autism and at what point you were diagnosed? Because I actually don't know that. <laughs> yeah, so I wasn't diagnosed till my late 30s. Mm. And uh, I had been diagnosed with learning disabilities and stuff like that. But it wasn't until my late 30s uh, that I was diagnosed. And uh, it was just sort of a, a surprise to me because I met somebody and they were like, oh, yeah, you're definitely on the spectrum. And you're just like somebody else I know. And I thought they were crazy. But then I asked my health care provider and I went through the process, you know. So there was a screening and there was interviews and stuff like that. And um, since I already had been diagnosed with, the, well, I'd been recently diagnosed with with uh, generalized anxiety, and uh, I had previously, since I was a child, diagnosed with learning disabilities. And then you find out that all those things usually come as a package, you know, sort of a smorgasbord of of symptoms that might be packaged together when you when you have an autistic diagnosis. So when you were diagnosed, did they ever mention anything about any type of, you know, lifestyle changes or dietary changes that would make life easy for you? No, you find out as an adult that there's not a lot of attention to uh, autistic adults at all. It's mostly focused around children yeah. and the families that, you know, take care of them. So... Um, that was, was the first thing I do is go out and meet more people like myself, high functioning adult autistics. And of course that's a pretty broad range in itself. Right. So, yeah. and then realized that there's a lot of other people like me. We, you know, autism wasn't as frequently diagnosed, even my learning disabilities. When I was first diagnosed, they had different names from different people because the sort of criteria in the school of thought or the schools that, that the specialists came from you know, handled the diagnosis differently and gave it different labels. And then, you know, eventually sometimes they're like, well, you're dyslexic and you have dysgraphia and, and those kind of terms that that we, we were all familiar with. But previous to that, there were other sort of obscure labels that they don't use anymore. Yeah, Have so you said anything about diet? <laughs> you said anything about any, anything. They're like, here's some medication. This ought to help with the anxiety. You're doing pretty good. Uh, we're proud of you. You know, I don't, we, there's not much else we can do for you. That's, that, that was essentially it. So, you know, people are behaving a certain way and it makes no sense to me, right? And, it, you know, there was a lot of, I had a tremendous amount of social anxiety before that. Well, and, you know, it took a while to adjust and realize, like, you know, people just don't perceive the situation the way you do. And you don't understand necessarily the rules of engagement, you know, how the conversation flows and, you know, who's talking about what and, and, and all that and how people behave. So in the, when, I, when, I, when I got the diagnosis, and I was like, well, okay, so now I know that they perceive something I don't, and they're ignoring something that I'm focused on in, in a nutshell, right? Yeah. It's kind of eliminate a lot of confusion for me. Yeah. Well, that must have been a relief in some ways. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride has herself an autistic kid and in my own journey I went through her videos and heard her say that some can't eat any plant foods at all because their gut microbiome is so messed up 
and this led me to read her books the yellow one and the green one and it truly helped me to just have the courage and try the no plant approach after Palil failed miserably. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride quote an absolute resuscitation for an anemic person is eating liver. Liver is a true powerhouse of nutrition. Whichever nutrient you take, find it in abundance in liver, including all the nutrients which GAPS people are deficient in. Making sure that your GAPS patient eats some liver on a regular basis will do immeasurably more for his or her nutritional status than the best and the most expensive supplements in the world. Folate, the richest source by far, is liver. It is easier for the human digestive system to extract nutrients from animal foods. Folate is particularly essential to have in pregnancy in order to prevent neural defect. This is why every traditional culture made sure that pregnant women ate liver regularly in order to provide plenty of folate as well as many other nutrients in the biochemical form which is easy to digest and assimilate. An anemic person should eat liver and other organ meats once a week at least. A child needs a small amount, one to two tablespoons of cooked ground liver every other day, which can be mixed with any meat dish or a full liver meal once a week. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride speaks about no plant gaps. In the book Vegetarianism Explained and on her website Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride talks about her no plant gaps version. Many people would be surprised to hear that human beings can live exclusively on animal foods. In my clinic I have patients who live entirely on animal food with great results, both children and adults. Patient with ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease and severe mental illness do very well on an all plant gaps diet. Not a leaf, not a speck of anything from the plant kingdom is consumed. These people live on meats, including organ meats, animal fats, meat stock and bone broth, fish including shellfish and mollusks, fish stock, fresh eggs and fermented raw dairy, kefir, sour cream, ghee, butter, cheese and yogurt. So at what point did you start looking into food or... Was it just an accident? How how, how did you yeah, one <laughs> had, start? Yeah, so change change of my diet really had nothing to do with it. I didn't expect it to affect mm -hmm. the say autistic symptoms at all. I said I said you know what's what's it all about? You know it's like and he's like oh it's it's really about controlling insulin. It's really about you know uh, you know not eating too many carbs and we didn't neither one of us knew anything about that but the but we started looking into it we started reading books and i think we started with gary Taubes is why we get fat that was like the first our first foray into the low carb world and my buddy aaron kind of we both got on the keto train and he stayed there and uh, I, I was hardcore. I mean, I built spreadsheets and I was doing glucose and <laughs> ketone tests all the time and I was logging food and I was doing experiments like, well, what happens if you eat a whole pound of spinach, you know, or whatever. 
And then it's kind of weird because you talk to, you know, friends and family and they're, they kind of didn't know what keto was. And, you know, and I was saying, yeah, but I, you know, I mean, a high fat diet and this and that, and I feel great. And I had really bad arthritis at the time. I'd been a gym rat for a number of years and I loved going to the gym and lifting. I was doing cardio all the time and I was still getting heavier and heavier. I was getting fatter and fatter and not putting on muscle. And I was, you know, like my late twenties and early thirties and, and the pain was so bad. It's like my sort of quintessential story was like, I would eat an apple on the way to work in the car, I'm driving a lot of traffic, sometimes a banana. And I noticed when I got out of the car, when I got to work, that I was in far more pain after I ate that food. And I, was, and I, you know, I grew up with that moniker that a apple a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah. You know, I thought I was doing something good for myself. <laughs> right. And I was like, could it, could this apple be causing all this joint pain? And then of course you go on keto, you're cutting out carbs. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm nearly debilitating arthritis started to improve within the first week. I know so like, holy cow, I had terrible sciatica. I had bouts of time when I would drag one foot behind me for almost a month because I couldn't walk on both feet because the sciatica was so bad. I couldn't roll over in bed. I could barely get out of bed, you know, and I'd wake up in the morning and my, my, my fist would be clenched, you know, and it would hurt to straighten out my hands. And I was worried about being, not being able to work, you know, and I basically have a desk job. So I was like, I, I don't even know if I'm be able to keep working a keyboard. So, yeah. so that's how it started. So the, the, the sort of improving and alleviating of the autistic symptoms came as a surprise down the road. Interesting. And the arthritis went away. So did you just go lower and lower carb or did you do some research and found carnivore? Uh, specific. The silliest thing happened. <laughs> when I, I was having the conversations with like my cousins and stuff randomly, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm eating this high fat diet, and you know, I'm not eating any sugar, or grains, or starches or anything." And and I said, "Yeah, you know, like I'll have some bacon or whatever." And and on two separate sides of the family, so one side is all pure blood Norwegian. The other side's a little more mixed, but still typically Scandinavian. And there, uh, one cousin said, oh, do you remember great aunt so-and-so? She ate a, a half a package of bacon every day. She lived to be a hundred and whatever. I was like, no, I didn't know that. You're like, and then on, on the <laughs> other side of the, <laughs> the other side of the family, I heard the same thing. I was like, so two different branches of the family, there was these people, this generation that ate bacon which is, you know, a processed meat, you know, it's supposed to be horrible for you, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so it's like one morning I got up and I cooked a whole package of bacon. I'm not a, I'm not a small guy, so <laughs> eating a pound, you know, a whole pound of bacon, that's almost half a kilo, right, is is yeah. not a, is not really a, that much of a challenge for me. So anyways, uh, I, I felt amazing, you know. I was like, man, this is great. And Straight then little away. by little I started – I felt great all day. Wow. I was like, this, this is amazing. And then I was like, what if all the, the spinach and cauliflower and stuff that I'm eating, you know, I'd, I'd try and make bread out of flaxseed or, you know, coconut flour or whatever, you know, and I was, it, it was all right, I guess, but I, I didn't really like it. And I, it seemed like a hassle. And I noticed that when I violated that, that all important rule of not eating too much protein, I felt way better. And I noticed I felt better on the animal fat than say the, the coconut oil or the other, the other fats, the plant oils, mm. the seed oils, the, yeah. you know, so I was gravitating that direction and I felt like, uh, I was like, I, there was no, I didn't know anybody approved of that at the time. So then I started looking, right. And I remember like finding World Carnivore Tribe on Facebook and there was like 5,000 people there or something. It blew my mind, you know, it's like 50,000 now. <laughs> but I was like, and then, and then Sean Baker was on Joe Rogan and then my, my head literally exploded. So I was like, holy crap, there's a doctor. He's, 
talking about just eating meat. And then, and by then I had discovered, you know, zero carb Zen and, um, lots of the other sort of legendary, um, carnivore group. Um, I, w- I started eat, just eating meat and then I was like, maybe this is in my head, right? Maybe I just wanted to eat meat and it's sort of a placebo effect. So I tried to go back to keto. I was like, I'll give keto another month. And I made it like maybe a week because I still had bagged frozen cauliflower in the, in the fridge, you know, with all that stuff. And, and I, I was like, no, I don't feel as good. I knew right away, like, uh, that, uh, just eating meat, you know, clearly was making me, uh, it was, there, it was, there was a lot of cognitive, um, sort of enhancement, my anxiety that it, I did, I was just, uh, I hadn't really known I had an anxiety disorder for a really long, until the same time I, about the same time I got diagnosed with autism. But I, once I was kind of working on that and I was noticing it was getting better and better. It's like, it's a slow taper. The arthritis was gone really fast, but the anxiety was tapering off, you know, and I could, I could tell it's like, wow, this is, this is like what it's getting closer to feeling like what people are supposed to feel like, I think, you know, and it it was clearly uh, the more meat I ate, the better I felt. So does it have to do with the meat? Oh, sorry, the, the, um, the amount of meat that you're eating, or is it the fat? What do you think it is that is making the difference? Or is it just cutting um, out vegetables? Well, I think it, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm, on a, I'm an earnest believer that, that there are enough sort of anti-nutrients slash pesticides in, in plants, and that, that they, you know, they're binding up nutrients and causing causing, you know, bowel irritation, stuff like that, fiber in general. I think, uh, I think people don't have the capacity for fiber that we've been led to believe, you know, and I, I think that's individual. I think, you know, certain people tolerate different amounts of different things, but I think I had, had essentially had a deficiency of animal fat and, um, a deficiency in protein, you know, so, uh, People, you know, and I do, I do a fair bit, bit of coaching and stuff, particularly with autistic people. And I think in the beginning, people tend to do better on high fat, but as we adapt, I think we get a little more efficient. And somebody like myself, like I go back to weightlifting after being out of it for quite some time, like eight years, I gave it up for, because of the arthritis and I lift more now, I'm going to be 52 in less than a month. And I can lift way more now than I could when I was in my 20s and thir- early 30s. That's I mean, awesome. a lot more. Like, I can squat, like, 600 pounds, which is, <laughs> you know, I know I know it's, uh, there's a lot of metric people out there. We're, we're, we're behind yeah. the time. So that's something like, uh, close to 300 you know, kilos. 280 kilos yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I do that every week, no problem. And I, I actually have crushed this in my back. I had terrible back pain, neck pain. Every t- every time I did squats, I got horrible neck pain before that. And I had a full body scan, so I have like all this documentation of uh, of all these things. I like got hernias, herniated discs, you know, the whole nine yards. And I have absolutely no joint pain anymore. Which, you know, going from like I, when I was in my late thirties, early forties. I felt like I was just an accumulation of injuries and allergies. And I had terrible allergies that usually led to sinus infections and then ear infections and then chest infections and on and on. And, you know, like every year I got the flu and the cold like everybody else, right? Yeah. And so in the last four years that I've been carnivore, because I'm right at that point where I've been eating nothing but meat for four years, I have had one sore throat and that was like three years ago. So I've, I have... I don't, I don't need any, I haven't had any colds or flus. I don't take any allergy medicines anymore. My allergies are basically gone. I get a little, you know, the wind kicks up and there's some stuff in the air. I sneeze a little and it's over. Do you take any supplements? Oh, sorry. Um, no, the only time I take supplements is kind of prophylactic. Like if I, I don't drink a lot of coffee anymore, but I used to. And so sometimes on the weekend I drink coffee and I, I'd supple, I take some B1 just in case because I know like things like coffee or if I, if I'm celebrating and I'm drinking alcohol, I'll take the B1 because I know that it tends to lower thiamine levels. You know, yeah. it's kind of like, 
I feel like I've transgressed, so I better I better uh, hedge my bet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, generally, no, I don't. Sometimes uh, when I do a heavy workout, I'll take like the DHEA because it seems to speed up my recovery. Because when I do like leg day or something, I'll do multiple sets of squats plus I do leg press and stuff like that. So. Uh, I've noticed, and I like to go to the gym a lot. I'm, you know, it's like, for me, it's like, it's more part of my, I'm very routine driven. So like, and that's probably a lot of people on the spectrum will understand that like they don't, it's difficult for them when their routine's interrupted. So um, it's easier for me to just try and go every day than it is to try and, try and go every other day. So yeah. I do things like DHA, DHEA to speed up recovery so I can keep going to the gym. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's awesome. So other than the the mental health and, you know, the anxiety, the brain fog, what was there anything else that you think that well that you have seen maybe in other autistic people that improves when they just go on a meat only diet? Yeah, I think they, they um, like myself, I'm actually more social than I was. I always wanted to be social, and of course, I had a, I had a hard time being social. Um, and some autistic people don't want to be social. I've got autistic pals that I talk to online that are happy to be hermits. They they think the COVID lockdown was a godsend. <laughs> I don't have to deal with anybody. <laughs> so, yeah. But I, I, wanted, I always wanted to be social, but... Um, I, it's much easier for me to be social. If you go back to my early videos on my YouTube channel, I never even appeared on camera because I was like, oh, I can't, I can't be on camera. I saw I'd narrate slides. That's basically what I did, slides and pictures. And somewhere in there, like the, the switch flipped, you know, and I started becoming more outgoing. I started becoming more comfortable talking to people I didn't know. Um, the, you know, being dyslexic too, all of a sudden I started noticing, like I would remember phone numbers in order which had never happened before. Like even stuff I wasn't trying to remember, like it would come up and so we go, Oh yeah, didn't we call blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Hey, I remember the number, you know, and that never <laughs> happened before in my life. So I'm not saying I never, dyslexia is never a problem. And I'm not, you know, dysgraphia is where you don't write well, you know, um, you know, I, I kind of, kind of replaced writing with the keyboard like most people. So, um, my, my handwriting is still fairly atrocious. I don't even, I, I look at it sometimes and I can't believe that's my handwriting because it doesn't even look the same from day to day. But, you should be a doctor uh, then. There's a lot of that. Yeah. A lot of those little things, you know, so even, uh, telling one color from another, cause you know, you know, sometimes autistic people have this problem where, where certain colors trigger a sensation rather than, than it being a being able to identify it as a color. You know, and I notice there's less of that. So it's like uh, being able to distinguish things um, better and, of course, fewer, like, meltdown kind of stuff going on. So. Well, I just, I think that, you know, for me, the my foundation in, in, in not thinking and in, in believing that this really is a good diet, you know, I'm full-time carnivore, just eat meat. I look at the historical record and I look at the, the archaeology and the biology and we know that we've been eating animals, butchering animals for at least 3.7 million years. That's a long time. That's where the archaeological evidence states it quite profoundly that our, our answers to pre-humans were doing this. And we kind of all grow up thinking there's all these plants out there that we were eating. But then I asked people, you know, before 10,000 years ago, what, what plants were we eating? And they never know because there were very, there was very, very few plants that weren't really toxic to us. So then when you realize that most plants are toxic to human beings and all the stuff in our grocery stores was crossbred to be less toxic, to be more palatable, then you realize it's not so far fetched for us to have been eating meat. We were literally falling around mega funnel like, like mammoths and, and eating them because that was that was how we evolved. We evolved to eat meat. So for me, that was kind of like the thing. And then it's just not much of a stretch to say once we eat the, the diet that we 
evolve to eat, we feel a lot better, right? So that kind of takes a little bit of the mystery out of it. So, and I encourage people, I have time I was sending out data to people um, and showing them, look, here's the archaeological evidence, here's the nitrogen isotopes from the Planck Institute, and on and on and on. So I think that, you know, by helping people understand that there's historical context that's backed up by hard science, then it doesn't seem so woo-woo, so far-fetched, you know. So go ahead and try it. You're not going to fall over dead.